And uh, it's nice to come to a security conference and not really have to, uh, you know, get my spook on. <laughs> okay, so, except with a couple people, you know who you are. <laughs> but uh, I like the content. Hello? And it crapped out. <coughs> you don't like the mics. Hello? That's all right, I'll just speak up. So, I, uh, I like the content too, and this is a great location. So, I drove up from Gainesville, Florida. I worked for the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice drive, too. It's like eight hours or something. Uh, I drove up. Um, uh, from the University of Florida. Uh, I work in the Health Science Center there as a, a network uh, security analyst. So it's a teaching hospital. Uh, so you can imagine um, it's a pretty stringent environment, but uh, it's, uh, it's scary. Down the road, I think after I leave the health um, side of security, I'll, I'll do a presentation on that. So <laughs> I really want to make a point here, and it's great to see some ladies here. Um, you know, the women add so much to this business, and uh, we need more women in security. So, you know, you guys got to recruit these women and get them in here because we're missing out on entire perspectives and aspects of security because of this gender issue. Moving on. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk about electronic door access controllers. I'll call them EDACs. And I'm uh, just going to go high level. Who are these vendors? What's going on in this area as far as um, you know, who the major players are? I'm going to touch on the architecture, mostly on a, a, a specific vendor that I've been working on. Um, anybody here from S2 Security by chance? Any legal representation from S2 Security? <laughs> Good. Good. Um, I am going to uh, release a vulnerability today, so it's something to stick around for. It'll be uh, actually a couple will be interesting. And uh, but the, the point I want to make is um, this is kind of a precursor to uh, um, I'm presenting at Hack in the Box in Dubai next month. And uh, so I'm going to release the full paper uh, then. So there'll be a lot more details coming up. I'm also giving the vendors some more time. I've been working closely with CERT. Um, mad props to CERT. So I couldn't move forward with a lot with these guys. So I'm going to talk about um, some ways to research this and what the vulnerabilities are and the attacks. And now, the takeaway from this will be that you can apply this to a lot of embedded devices, because embedded devices are tricky to test. Um, it's not like you can do a whole lot of you know, CPU monitoring or memory monitoring on them. It's hard to get information off of them sometimes. So there's going to be aspects of this that I'll highlight that are, are transferable to a lot of different types of security analysis. So learning outcomes for today. I'm sorry if this comes across as a little pedantic at first, but I'd just like to really put it on the table. And uh, so you're going to you know, get an increased awareness, trends like we talked about. You're going to be able to walk out of here today with specific pen testing knowledge on these systems, be it in your own company or if you're doing uh, you know, legitimate pen testing out there. Um, I really want to stress enough that, uh, I, I can't stress enough that, um, please don't use this in a bad way. Don't go out there and hose these systems up because it's building access, a lot of safety issues involved. Um, it can get very ugly very quickly. I'm dying to heat up here. So. Is anybody else warm? Okay, That's all right. It's good. Turn the heat up. I like it. Got to get ready for Dubai anyway. <laughs> Just glad I'm not going over there wearing body armor. Okay. <laughs> so, getting back to this company that I'm, I've been focusing on, S2 Security, and uh, this is one of the beauties of, of being on a college campus and having access to like LexisNexis, Academic Universe, and ABI Inform, which are huge databases. That means I can go back to 2004 and pull an article that the CEO wrote. Um, you're not going to get that on Google, okay? You're not going to get that off the company website. So. That's a really important thing when you're doing your research is to go, you can step onto a college campus and use those resources for free. You don't need to be a student. You just need to get on campus. Um, this quotation from uh, Attorney General uh, Reno, you all probably remember it, it's yeah. way back in 2000. What happened was they did a penetration test on, on <coughs> several government buildings, CIA, FBI, uh, DOJ, and they 
some people actually from the Government Accountability Office got into the building and got right up to the door. And uh, after, you know, all the, the, the press releases and everything kind of sell down, but they had a, 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 a meeting. And this is what she said. And people have quoted this a lot, but I think this pertains especially true to this class of device in these buildings. Because that's what this is. This is building security. And everybody knows, okay, when an attacker gets physical access, it's game over. Always. So, what you have is a lot of these systems are proprietary, and they use proprietary uh, protocols, and they use uh, uh, dedicated uh, lines. They won't go over the IP of the network, and they'll have you know dedicated wires going to these. But there's a movement now towards this convergence, and that's almost a Cisco-y term, um, but I'll borrow it for this because it, it, it works. And what they're doing is they're pulling this video into it. They're at, adding other building systems into these devices, these brains of these uh, uh, of your of your building, and you know elevator control, alarms, HVAC. I think somebody might have gotten into this one here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the really cool things is uh, they're using power over Ethernet to charge up a capacitor in the door lock which will actually strike the bolt when you come up and use your car to authenticate to the, to the door. So, and the capacitor charges up um, in a matter of like 300 milliseconds uh, for some of these companies. But now you look at that from a cost perspective of not having to run power to each one of these uh, devices, um, to the actual uh, card readers and the doors. But then you look at the at attack surface that comes up with that, you know, and now instead of an outlet in the wall, right, which is true power, and you, you, you trust it, and it's always reliable, mostly. It's now going to your Cisco switch or whatever switch that's providing the power over Ethernet. So now your, you know, your switch is now your power station. These are the kinds of things that people don't really talk about when they talk about this um, uh, expanding capabilities. You see a lot of these using embedded Linux, various distributions. I'll get more specific on that. And then, uh, Huge number of vendors in this space. So Cisco Systems just did a, a purchase back in November of Richard Zeta. And uh, hopefully that'll be the next system I can get my evil little hands on. Uh, I'm going to work my uh, security uh, engineer at University of Florida or contact there. I'm sorry, sales engineer. And uh, see if I can get something from them. S2 Security, uh, my previous job was a marketing company down in St. Pete, Florida. And uh, we were looking at different building security <laughs> systems. I got a hold of uh, this because uh, the vendor reseller came in. And I said, well, you know, I got to take a look at this box and see how it integrates into our network and stuff. And uh, so I only had the box for about a week. Um, but I've been able to find some online demo access, uh, which I've been able to do some follow-up testing on. So if you guys go out there and find these demos, don't hose them up because I'm still doing some verification. So this is what you'll see, right? You know, I work at a university and this is our typical facilities guy. <laughs> and that's what they are. They're, these devices are managed you know, by like a secretary, an HR, or uh, building facilities people. Anybody, everybody here mostly is in IT. Has anybody here ever configured one of these door access control systems? That's, that's great. That's great. And from a security perspective, if they pulled you in when you were deploying this, that's even better. But most of the time, it's one of these things that, you know, it's, it's, it's our domain, it's not yours. The facilities guys, the physical security is separated from the IT security. And the problem is, is you have this convergence, this IP convergence coming together, and they're slapping this stuff on your network. So you need to be aware of what's going on. They sell these devices as embedded, standalone, stick them in a closet, 10-year cycle before you rotate them out. You know. Policies, your corporate policies and your information security policies probably don't even apply to these. Um, they're, they're just one of those kinds of things that, you know, it, it, even though you use it every day, you badge in the lab, you badge in the building, it's just one of those things like, oh, well, you know, those guys must really have it then, right? I mean, there's, you just assume that they're, you know, they have it together. Company name is S2 Security. And they got security in the company name, and they, they really got together, right? 
And what you'll see is uh, a lot of uh, uh, a trickle down. So a manufacturer will make this and then it goes to uh, a reseller and then a local guy will do the actual installation and configuration. <coughs> so there's a lot of different parties involved in this and, and I'm going to point out later on that what I view it as a, a, a cascading failure of responsibility. And uh, last but not least, I mean, you may not even have your people in your building, uh, your employees, handling this. So it, it, it might very well be outsourced. You have somebody in Karachi you know, handling this for you. So a picture is always great. And I want to point out what this actually looks like. So this is the box. This is the brain. And what you got here is this guy here is your network controller. And that's got a web server in there. It's got a database. It's got um, some other connectivity to uh, you know, perform backups and, and administration. And uh, then it will connect into these application mo modules here, which will then go out to like micro nodes, which will be you know even a smaller embedded system that doesn't have all the database and doesn't have all the connectivity to it, but it has a speci specific person purpose, which is just to run that card reader that you have to the door. So card reader to a controller, I mean to a to a node, and then it will pop back into the network controller. So here's a good example, and this is uh, from S2 Security. And so at the top center there is the uh, network controller, which you just saw on the previous slide. And then you see it goes into right into the corporate LAN, and then you'll have one of those expansion nodes, which is down a second tier there, and that's what actually would run out to the door. And so you see, in this architecture that they throw out, you know, it's not about having it isolated. It's about having, or um, even on separate VLANs, it's about having this thing just slap it on your network, connect it to your IP cameras, and you can manage it from everywhere. So this is the net box. And uh, there's about 7,000 of these systems installed <coughs> worldwide. You know, schools, schools are probably their, their biggest uh, vertical, uh, the education market. They're really getting these into a lot of like high schools and also uh, some colleges. And also in like hospitals, a lot of, there's even case studies on their website about hospitals. Didn't find a case study about any uh, uh, law enforcement agency facilities on there, but that's where it goes back to the, to the LexisNexis search. And, uh, you know, digging up articles. But, you know, there's a couple police stations that have this in, installed too. <coughs> And uh, I mentioned this uh, a little while ago, and that's that the same box is sold under, under multiple brand names. So S2 Security is the company in Massachusetts. They build this thing. Lanier purchased the distribution rights from S2 Security, so they handle, they rebrand it, and then they handle all the reselling out to yet another tier that goes down. And then resellers may rebrand it again. And so this is actually, uh, if you go to Sonitrol and look at their e-access solution, this is the same box that S2 makes. But it's not readily apparent because you've got to follow through that, that distribution chain. And uh, what's, uh, you know, what's interesting about this, I mean, <laughs> there's lots of interesting things about this. But from a, a, a vulnerability perspective and, and keeping your software up to date, you know, there's a lot of different places that a customer needs to go to find out what's going on. You've got information flow that needs to happen all the way from S2 security through Lanier all the way to the end, uh, um, end users. And, uh, you know, do you really trust some small, you know, not to disparage anybody, but, you know, a small local yokel kind of security company, physical security company, guys don't know IP, and they're the ones that you need to depend upon to, to figure out if this thing has any vulnerabilities, or needs to get an upgrade, or cache. So, this happens a lot in IT. I mean, there's, you know, there's boxes, and they get rebranded, and, and all that, but when it comes to critical devices on a network like this, you know, I, I think that it just needs to be um, much more clear for the, for the end users. 
So, again, you know, reading up on this, it's, uh, it's always important to do your background reading. I mean, it's great to jump onto a network and get your box in the lab and, you know, fire all the tools out, get the scans going, get your fingerprinting going, you know, figure <coughs> out what the defaults are, passwords and stuff, but it's always good to go kick back and do some reading. And this tiny URL link there is a, uh, uh, an S2 and uh, MySQL um, case study that uh, MySQL wrote. And from that, all of this great attacker information was derived. You know, they told me they could use the Samba client. They told me they could use MySQL, MyISM. I got the Linux distribution off of that. You know, it's the same Linux distribution that's used in Zorus. Everybody knows those little Zorus, you know, handhelds. Cool, right? Great. Um, processor. And this really struck me, was there, they only took 15 months from the design to their first customer ship. So, you know, fast, cheap, quality, pick two, right? That's the old line. <laughs> and then this, you know, they didn't have much prior experience with open source. So here they are with a whole new Linux operating system that they're using embedded. They're using different components, SQL, HTTP, they got to wrap this all up together and they did it only in 15 months. Wow. <laughs> now this last point was such a gimme because your file storage and where sensitive information is stored is critical, right? In your system, I mean if you can get it encrypted or if you have you know, specific user permissions on who can access it. <laughs> this right here told me that everything they have in there is stored in that MySQL database. So you get the database, you get the box. Yes, sir? Is that web interface written, was it, is it PHP or? No, uh, they're just using a, uh, a web browser and they've got lots of JavaScript. <laughs> a web server with JavaScript. Yeah. That's even easier. <laughs> Right, so the, the question was, is, are they using a web server with PHP? And, and uh, you know, it's much, much simpler than that. I'll get into some more details on that, too. Let me get one more time. Sure. Uh, all right, about 40 more minutes. Okay. Yes, we just give me That'd be great. Yeah. So I love reading <laughs> security vendor marketing. It's so enjoyable. I mean, the lies and hubris that come out <coughs> blow my mind every time. But it's great because I use their marketing statements against them. You know, they come out and they say that you can put this thing on the public internet. Well, you know, when I'm writing up an advisory <laughs> and sending that to CERT, okay, who then passes it along to them, you know, they come back and they say, oh, it's always you know, deep within the corporate you know, network and you know, you have to have a VP, you should use a VPN and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, that's not what you guys are writing. Well, you know, I come back with an email, it's like kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, like, hey, you know, it's marketing speak. I'm like, well, you know, I don't buy that, pal. So, you know, you want to write that and put that out there that you can put this thing on the public internet. Well, I'm going to show you later on where these are on the public internet. <laughs> this bottom one is really scary, too. I mean, is there any piece of software out there that you can really expect to be maintenance-free for years? Sure. No way. Sure, Linux. <laughs> <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> That's a different time slot. <laughs> Bike racks, three o'clock, no friends. <laughs> so. Thank you for this gentleman bringing this up because I'm going to get into some of these components here. And uh, we'll see. So, anybody here ever hear this go ahead web server? Oh, yeah. Man, it's all <laughs> over the place. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's in modems, cable modems, it's I everywhere. I saw it a lot in uh, industrial Ethernet switches. <laughs> right, like SCADA stuff. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, I, you know, I, I, I call them out on this and say it is a very poor choice uh, for a web server. You know, I'd, I'd be less <coughs> happy with uh, you know, Apache, of course, but then there's you know, more development stuff. But, you know, there's 16 vulnerabilities out there going back to like 2000, yeah, 2000 in this, in this web server. And I didn't see a single one, single vendor response to any of these. 
Now it's really interesting because I see that they now made this uh, software, uh, this web server is now open source. But I don't see a development community out there that's backing it. You know, I'm not seeing, um, you know, anybody with track set up, you know, with uh, um, C CVS, okay, or SVN, right, or code management. There's nothing. There's forums. There's a few posts. There's, I mean, there's, there's really <coughs> nothing out there this, this, as far as a open source community that took this off the company's hands and, uh, and, is, and is taking ownership of it. So what I think happened is that these, these vulnerabilities started rolling in and uh, this company was like, you know, we don't have the staff, we don't have the people, we're just going to take this thing and make it open source. But they still sell it. <laughs> and they don't fix it, but it's open source. So they pass the, the you know, it's cost shifting, it's risk shifting, it's responsibility shifting. And this is a, a perfect example of this bottom one here. You know, it's contacted them on three different occasions during the last three months, and they didn't give us a meaningful response. You know, if you go through the, the bugs on each one of these, you'll see pretty much that same um, kind of response. So their opinion is, we open sourced it, we don't have to deal with security, despite the fact that we will happily sell it to people? Oh, they're not going to give you that answer. Right. <laughs> they, you don't, you that's no what answer. it amounts to. <laughs> that's what I see. Okay. So all it takes is, you know, somebody to exploit one of these vulnerabilities, the company that, you know, got owned, right, somebody walked right through the front door or whatever, can go ahead and sue, sue whoever makes go ahead web server well, not addressing these vulnerabilities. I, I don't know. Open I mean, source, you know. My, my point is, is open source doesn't instantly mean we don't have to do shit. Right. That's a joke. Right. I mean, it, it does not absolve them of, of, you know, in a moral sense, it doesn't absolve them. So, But in a legal sense, you know, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. But I look at some of these end user license agreements, I and mean, this thing can, you know, kill my cat and, and put my grandma on a death panel and do everything, and uh, bad to me, and and they absolve themselves of any liability. Right. So I guess it really depends upon how they're selling it. Not necessarily. If you if you leverage open source software in in, in, a, in a product that you're selling and standing behind, you have you basically have no excuse. You can't claim, oh, we don't know what the code is. Oh, we just licensed it from this other company. You can't redirect the blame. It's it's your bag. You even have the ability to go in and fix the problems. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's there's a lot of liability involved. Well, there's a lot in, of lawyers out there that can just turn everything you just said to 100 degrees and suddenly make them fall of you for not. I don't want. I didn't mean to start yeah. this or debate. Very slippery. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's it's. So I guess it depends on who you're going to so, whether they have better lawyers. I didn't mean to start the debate. Can we just agree that there's two sides to it and they both suck equally? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you suffer as the, the end yeah. user. Yeah. Um, Whoever buys this is left with their wang flapping in the wind. Yeah. I'll tell you, you know, and this, this, this legal stuff comes up time and time again. And, and you know, I, I, if you have any inkling of going to law school, I mean, I say doing, you know, five, ten years of security work and then going to law school. It's great, <laughs> okay, because you can come out of there and, and you know, really have a handle and, and be able to speak geek and speak suit and speak legal. Um, and when you can tie those three together, um, you, you can be a force. Or you probably just sell out to the man and you know, work for an insurance company. <laughs> this quotation on the bottom, um, that came from that uh, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2004 uh, paper that he wrote. And you know, this is—I don't want to harp on this guy, but again, you know, you put this information out there, you put these statements out there. You know, well, you know, it's—it's it's a challenge, and not everyone's rising up to it. Meaning, the assumption is is that we are, right? He doesn't say that, but that's what you get out of that. So here's SQL. I couldn't believe when I got a hold of this because when I popped this box and got the database. I looked at the version and it was 4.0. And I was like, man, I'm no database guy, but 4.0 sounds old. <laughs> so I went to MySQL.com to download it. This is what I see on the bottom here. Because 4.0 is or such low demand, we've decided to stop posting <coughs> binaries. You can't even, I mean, you know, end of life, end of download. <laughs> you, know, you can't even get this thing from MySQL. It's, it's that old. Now, a caveat here, that's with the NetBox version 2.0s. Two, two but the 3.0s use Postgres. 
haven't really dug into that, but obviously, you know, there's a, a host of vulnerabilities that are associated with databases, and in particular, providing any kind of network access. So the purpose that they, the reason that they provide this network access on, on 3306 there, I should put that's TCP, obviously, um, is uh, for reports generation. So there's third-party products like Crystal that can tie into this system and interface with the, the ODBC directly, extract information, and then create um, you know, reports. So for example, you have a door that goes out to the smoking area. Well, I want reports of everyone who uses that smoking area door, and then that goes to HR, we can adjust their health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Payments. <coughs> That's just a creepy way that this could be used, but um, you now it's, it's something to keep in mind. Because the importance of this logging and, and access on these systems is huge. Recall last year up in, um, at Yale, there was a young lady who was killed by a, a lab technician. She was a student there. Police came in, you know, state police, they, they were investigating. This guy was in the lab, and uh, while they were doing their investigating, okay, and he was covering up pieces of the crime scene that he had done. So he like dropped the pen, he had brought in a fish hook and a line and was trying to re retrieve this pen from the hole, in the, the, the hole in the wall that he stuck this poor woman's body in after he killed her. Now, a huge part of them being able to track this was they were looking at the badge access and they got him and her in the same room and then she didn't come out okay, with her badge. And that's how they pinpoint this guy. So the importance of, of logging and access and, and uh, this obviously the security of these devices can't be underestimated because you know here you are you got the state police of Connecticut you got the local police probably the FBI in there too you know and they're still you know they, they, they didn't isolate I'm not going to get into their, their crime scene procedures but you know unless they had had this information come to them meaning the logs the door access and that this guy and this young lady were in the same room together and she didn't come out you know, he might have been able to cover up that crime scene even more. And maybe even gotten away with it. And if he had known this stuff and they used this system, he might have just wiped that box. There's real life implications to this. This is a, uh, this is very interesting here. So that a, lot of, a lot of companies, they need to write their own custom applications. This is the communication <laughs> protocol that is used to do auto discovery of the nodes. So the nodes, again, connect, are out in the network over IP, and the nodes connect directly into the doors. So this uses multicast. There's a service listening on, on 7362 there, and uh, <coughs> obviously it was, it was coded by these guys. And they just got their patent for it, too. This gets back to doing your research, right? It's not just looking at the packets. It's not just looking at the, you know, what's running in this box. What's this company doing? Okay, are they, you know, are they patenting this stuff? You go look at that patent, you can get a lot of information on how this is, you know, architected to work. So, I mean, that's, a, that's almost, you know, it's almost an RFC, right, at that point, um, for how these guys operate this um, node auto discovery. And from there, you know, you look at the, I put jump and start your fuzzers. That's just directly attacking the box, easy stuff. You know, but you start talking about spoofing, okay, door node controllers, you know, what kind of authentication, how they really know what that device is. What about flooding? You know, you got 20 doors, right? But what if you have 3,000 okay, broadcasts on that network? Was it, will that system just, you know, croak? So there's, you know, what this does is it's, it's great. They're going to patent, they patented it, and they're going to try to sell this, you know, to other companies, of course. Or you know, just use it to protect their, their intellectual property. But it, it, it increases your attack surface, um, you know, whenever you do this. <coughs> Any questions on this so far? Oh, thanks. So, looking at uh, FTP and Telnet, FTP and Telnet on a box like this has no place, right? <laughs> Here's this guy's quotation. This is a CEO. We see some vendors fitting their serial devices with telnet adapters, which simply sit on the network transmitting unsecured serial data. 
some vendors. Not implying that, no, we would never do that. Right? Well, that's exactly what they do. Okay, so, you know, there's Telnet into the scene of managers, no SSH, right? Not even V1 that you get, you know, monkey in the middle with, with Doug Song's tools. Uh, and they use FTP for these database backups. So, and you don't even need to put a password in, by the way, on the FTP server. <laughs> and it has to be in a root directory, too. That's what it is. This is directly, that this network administrator's pass, that's right from their, their documentation. Right. Password's optional. I mean, if you're recommending, you know, the, the end, you got to remember, right? This goes through, you know, a couple resellers, then it goes to an end, end guy. They do do some training up there. They've run about 1,200 people through their training. And uh, they came back. I haven't had direct communication with them. It's all been through CERT and then me and then back through CERT and to them. Because so, what happened was, is, you know, I contacted them. I, I knew who made the box. I contacted S2 Security directly. I said, can I get a security point of contact? I did a read receipt on the email I sent. I see them popping up five, six, seven read receipts, okay, on this. And then finally, one guy, after another email, one of them got back to me and said, oh, yeah, give this guy out of Lanier from California a call because they do all, they handle all the S2 stuff. Like, I'm contacting, you guys make this box, you know, and now you're making me go out to another guy. So and, uh, I don't want to call people, you know, I want to have a record here, right? I want to have this document. So... I got the guy's email out in California. I emailed him and then I CC'd Sir. <coughs> and uh, at that point, it was, uh, yeah, they don't, they don't talk to me. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're plenty happy to threaten legal action. I'm like, for what? You know? I mean, I'm, you know, I got a hold of your box. I reported it to Sir. Reported it to you. We're well past 30 days in the majority of these vulnerabilities. I've done everything white hat as possible. You know, and you guys are going to lawyer up on me? I got nothing, man. Unless you're coming at me with criminal charges, you know, I'll, I'll take this in front of a jury <laughs> you know, any day. You know, again, I'm not a lawyer, but any lawyers in here, give me your card. <laughs> <laughs> Some pro bono work out of this. <laughs> Resume builder stuff. Don't, don't sue me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, actually, at the University of Florida now, it's don't shoot me in the face with your M4, bro. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear about a student, graduate student with some psychological problems from Ghana, uh, PhD, thought he was, uh, you know, thought he wasn't getting his visa renewed, thought that people were after him. There was some intervention before, and then the police got called because he was screaming in his house. I scream in my house all the time. I don't know why it's illegal. <laughs> they kicked in the door, five cops, and then they, you know, tased him, beanbagged him, still couldn't get this guy. And by the way, he had polio, okay, and he's using a cane. So, yeah, shot him in the jaw. Anyway, don't take that as a, a as a thing against any law enforcement because uh, I, I really have nothing but the utmost respect for law enforcement. But again, the guy's got polio and he's freaking out. And there's got to be better ways. Okay, I digress. <laughs> Coffee's in it. Yeah. So this is kind of cool, right? I mean, with this box, this is a, a, a screenshot of the web interface. <laughs> you can look at the floor plans of the building if they upload them, right? I mean, it's not, it's just a JPEG image. It's, it's, it's not, you know, clickable and all that. But from the TAC perspective, you know, you can get the layout of the building. I mean, this is right out of 24, this kind of stuff. Right? You know, I'm going to send it to your screen and all that. <laughs> Shit. If stuff only worked that way, you know? You're like, oh, wait a minute, i got to reboot my phone. <laughs> so right now, this is the only vulnerability that's publicly known out there. And this came in uh, January 4th. It was the first VU of the year. An unauthorized URL, okay, allows a factory reset of this controller. <laughs> I mean, not like wipe it, not like, you know, I mean, I'm talking like brick it, like it, it just came out of the box, you know, and you just cut the packing tape and open it up and pull it out. That's where this puts this. So all your backups are gone, unless you've been sending them over, you know, FTP to the backups. <laughs> yes, sir? Do the Ethernet locks fail open or close for him? That's a great question, okay? <laughs> because they came back to me on this, to CERT, and they said, 
and if you read the advisory, they say everything continues to work as normal. <laughs> Meaning that the nodes, okay, at this point, which connect to the doors, the nodes, even though this communication is cut back to their back to the brain, they still continue to function. <laughs> I don't buy that. Now I haven't been able to verify that and test that, but I'll tell you what you do lose. You lose all your logging. Okay, so you don't know who's using those doors. And you lose uh, the, the ability to do any obvious web control of the door. So you can't pop open a door remotely. You can't schedule it to be open at a certain time. Because fire regulations, as I understand, require electronic locks to fail open. Yeah. So if you go to a data closet and you power off your switch, which is providing power over Ethernet, don't all your doors unlock? Yeah. <laughs> it depends on the, on the location. You have a, a research facility that's got a biohazard. Uh, I can't fail. So, don't let the boogaloo flu out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like a typical federal facility, then yes, it's actually safety trumps security. So you're supposed to be gas. So yeah, you, you are correct. That's assuming that they're powered over Ethernet. That it is possible to power through the power through maze and still have IP. But you know, you get in a situation like a man trap. Yeah. I have one at the computer <coughs> <laughs> I, w I would expect that they, that they that they do fail open, or if they lose their power, that there's that power capacitor will sense that it can't recharge again, and at that point will trigger and keep that keep that uh, lock open. Um, I mean, this is where getting back to the legal legal stuff, the liability will really kick in. Okay, you know, if you have a fire or people can't get out of a building or you know for whatever reason, that's something that you know is tangible and people can sink their teeth into. You start talking about open source and code, you know, the, their eyes glass over and you know, they don't get it. But, uh, you know, little Jimmy, this is like the petticoat waste, you know, the, the petticoat fire back in the 1880s, you know, which revamped all of New York City building codes. I mean, there was a, you know, there was a, there was a shirt waste fire and they locked these workers in the room so they wouldn't leave, right? Take, you know, bathroom breaks and eat and things like that. And uh, there was a, a huge fire and like, you know, 50 women uh, who were sewing burned in this building and it changed all the fire codes. So. I talked a little bit about the, uh, you know, the vendor communications that we weren't that great and, you know, I got to get back and forth. But CERT, I can't say enough about those guys. Um, they, they really, really did a great job with this. Especially like Will Dorman, you know, Art Mannion, a couple, a couple solid characters. So, but again, you know, I haven't been able to verify all this because I only had the box on my desk in my cube for under a week. I didn't have the nodes set up. I didn't have all that. I was just mainly interested in, in the web interface and, and you know what other uh, security uh, concerns I would have about this management piece. So I'd love to, man. I mean, let me tell you, all those vendors that I mentioned before, you know, if somebody were to back me on this and provide me access to that, I'd do it. You know, for nothing. I mean, uh, you know, keep me busy for the next year, <coughs> um, going over those 10, 12 systems that I listed up there before. And uh, I'll do it for Taco Bell. <laughs> no. And what I'd really love to do is, uh, you know, if a vendor came to me and said, we want you to do a security evaluation of this, I'd say, great. I'll do it for the equivalent of your coffee budget. And you donate that coffee budget, the equivalent of that coffee budget, to start a hacker space. I don't make a dime. <laughs> Okay, hackerspace gets funded. You take a write-off of firing for, for, for um, helping a nonprofit for you know, for funding a nonprofit. You get a tax break on that, and you get a better product out of that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I love it. <coughs> you know, the one thing I really don't want to do is you know give any impl implication here that uh, you know I'm, I'm trying to ransom or or you know give somebody the hard sell. Nothing like that at all. Yeah, this is, this is fresh. You guys are the first on this. And this really is what makes this nasty, um, as far as what you can get. So I'm going to have to contact certain ask them to release this VU. Basically, URL attack again. Through the web interface, unauthenticated, you can download the database backups. So recall what I said before, right? This is SQL. Everything is packaged up in this database. When you get that database, you got everything. Um, 
Is it at least like hashed by the data, or is it just like plain clear? Oh, it's all clear text. <laughs> <laughs> so like. To, to, their, to their credit, the marketing guy who was getting back, going back and cert was like, oh, well, there's nothing in those, those databases, you know, and we, anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to waste your time. Just a quick clarification, are the, are the users or the, I don't know, some kind of credentials in the database? The users? Yeah, like. The yeah, the numbers on. yeah. Oh, yeah. They, so they, they got like the Wigan, you know, numbers on there. Yeah. They've got um, the uh, yeah. I mean, they have all the identifying factors of that individual badge for that employee, and plus, you know, you got you know, their names. You can go back to like a previous speaker said the Facebook stuff. So how do they how do they expect to work normally? Is it expect to reset? That's what they said, man. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, you know, am I going to really debate well, these guys? Is it actually in the database to authenticate, or is it something in the box that, that they would authenticate the badge without having to do anything else? Well, what, well, according to them, is that, you know, the, the, the brain's gone, right? You got your nodes hooked up to the doors. That means that this would have to push out those policies and that capability to each one of those nodes. But I've seen systems that do that. I have. Yeah. Okay. The, the, those are usually, like, old legacy systems that developed over the many decades and they use modems for communication. They're only now for the internet or our ethernet. Uh -huh. But I've also seen ones that don't do that. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I can think of is that they're, it may be uh, that they still function because the sensors default into a, hey, there's an ARFID tag there. Okay. <laughs> That's right. ATM door locks that That's work right. with any mag strike. So, you know, for me, the question is, is whether those nodes have the, uh, the capability, right? Memory, uh, storage, um, CPU, all that, to, uh, you know, pull this information down from the master and uh, be able to function standalone. And I say, you know, even if that happens, even if they are able to function, you know, when somebody badges into that door, does that record, when that brain comes back up and you restore it from your backup, are those logs then pushed in? Or do you have a, a blackout window where you have no idea of who's coming in and out of your building where? Or is it pushed down in clear text and you can intercept and manufacture your own? Yeah, no, that's, that's a given. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, just assume clear text with, with everything. They threw some, you know, oh, we use SHA-1. And, <laughs> so you're hashing something? No. Probably yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you get this database, it, it, it's game over. Um, and it's interesting because you get your full, um, <clears throat> like right in here, you know, this is the path. So when you, when you get this in the DAR format, you uncompress it, it gives you a path, uh, which is bare DB, blah, 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 and it goes all the way down. That's the, that's the beauty right there, just a flat, plain text file of everything. And uh, it was funny because when I first did this, um, you know, I did on my Linux box, and then I had Vare in there, and I was like, wait a minute, and I switched, you know, paths, and I went into my real Vare on my box, you know, and I was like looking around, what is all this? So, it was kind of a, oh, kick myself in the ass moment. So this is what, um, what these are, these are screenshots over uh, Putty, and looking at that all.db uh, uh, um, database. And I'm able to pull, there's the admin user. On the left, this is uh, version two of the netbox. And on the right, this is the version three. And you can see that uber secure hash. <laughs> I just use passcracking.com or .ru. And uh, this is when I was going back and forth with them, with the S2 people, because they're like, oh, well, you know, the, had, the, the admin password in there is encrypted. And I was like, thanks for telling me that it's in there. <laughs> You know, and you couldn't, you know, you couldn't really manipulate this information. I'm like, man, you want to do something creepy? You know, pull that database and then figure out a way to get it into like Multigo, right? Because you got all the users in there. You know, you can reach out and start spidering and pull information from different social sites. You can really get an idea of who's who. Because once you have this personal information in these systems and somebody can get to it, it turns from being just an IP out there on the internet and a web server to like, now I drill down, now I get access, now I find out who these people are in the system, go back out to the social sites, 
figure out, oh, well, these guys are in Louisiana. Oh, this is the company they work for. Because sometimes it's not in their net block space and you can't do you know, your, your DNS stuff. It's just a box that's out there. So are you saying that they recommend putting these systems right out on the internet? Is well, that they, they their marketing okay. says that, you know, yeah, you can stick this, you know, Baghdad Airport Road. <laughs> Good to go. Um, now, to their credit, you know, the guy, once I showed him this and this and, you know, some other things, they oh, well, we'll go back and, you know, review our training and tell these guys, you know, not to put these out on the internet directly. <laughs> Like, great, but what about the couple hundred customers that I'm going to show you in a few minutes who are out there right now? Or even if it is internally, if it's still on your internal network, it's not on an isolated network, physically isolated network, right? All it takes yeah. is somebody to get a foothold on that network via some random browser exploit or Adobe exploit, whatever the case may be. Right now they can just get access to all of your doors. Yeah. And really, you know, this business about, you know, or not, or not doesn't matter. You can, you can have your layers and you can have, um, you know, your firewalls and we've got head, <laughs> IDS and IPS, and, but it comes down to it, the front line is everywhere, man. I mean, it really is. And, uh, I, you know, you, people talk about firewalls and I'm like, man, you're just punching a hole through it, right? I mean, you're just allowing all that traffic to go through it. What's it doing? You know, oh, well, it does fix up inspection, whatever. It's more, more crap. No questions? By keeping you guys awake? Yeah. 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 Ten? Perfect. Here's the pawnage. Yes, sir. Can you just buy these? Um, I'm just obsessed now with these power of the net. <laughs> Can you buy them one at a time? I've seen some um, uh, vendors out there. Again, it's at you know it gets another that third third party market. One was like a Yahoo page where you could buy this system for. 1500 bucks for the controller, and then I think you get the nodes too. Do you know how much the, do you know roughly how much the door locks for battery this way? No. I'm sure they're on eBay. Yeah. Yeah. And they're real standardized too. That's the thing. So you get one, I mean, you're going to have a real good idea. Mm -hmm. But then there'll be those idiosyncrasies, right? It'll be like, um, you know, Deviant's talk yesterday about the handcuff keys. You know, there's always going to be those little one-offs on, on whatever vendor that you're using, but I'd love to type it those. I apologize if I'm skipping ahead. Not at all. Have you done any research into the communication between this product and those endpoints? No, I, I just haven't had the access. Okay. Um, the only thing I've really had the access to was um, the eMerge netbox, mm -hmm. sorry, the netbox itself for about a week, mm -hmm. and I've been using their online demos. Uh, version two, version three, yeah, just really subversive, like using their own stuff against them. It's it's a little dirty, but you know, I, I'm out here. I got nothing. It's uh, I'm gonna do what I can. This is really so extracting. So at this point, you know, you pulled the database, unauthenticated, unauthenticated URL. You've got the admin hash, the cracky hash. Now you have access to the web interface, which will allow you to do any number of, of really bad things. And this is Sonatrol. So again, you know, this rebranding that happens, right? This is Sonatrol's rebranding that they do. So it's a net box, but it's sold by Sonatrol. Um, and Sonatrol sells this as a, a, a SaaS, too. And you look, you know, here's your unlocks, right? You can unlock any of these um, facility doors that uh, just click, boom, it unlocks. Or you can set it. Uh, on that bottom left there is another screenshot I snuck in. And that's the smoker area, which is always going to be that back door, that side door. And, uh, you know, you can set it for O dark 100 um, to come back up and back the truck up and then go in there. But if you back that truck up, you know, I mean, they got the cameras going, you know, you're going to get busted, right? Well, maybe not. <laughs> okay. And this is great. This quotation on the bottom here is from the Bosch. And Bosch is another major vendor of this. Most hackers don't care about watching your lobby. I don't know what you're talking about, man. I love watching your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if they gain access to network, you're going to have their financial data and trade secrets, sure. But I'm going to watch your lobby, and then I'm going to shut the cameras off, and I'm going to open the doors, and I'm going to go in and grab the box okay, that has your, your trade secrets and your financial data. So again, you know, I, I mean, these marketing guys, they're, they're, they're easy to pick on and all that. 
Now, you sell your soul to the devil, man. There's people out here who are going to call you on this crap. DVRs. So these are digital video recorders, right? Um, there's several vendors that um, are integrated with uh, uh, S2 Netbox, and S2 provides the, the guides um, to do that. So here is uh, an example snip from one of the guides to set up a Panasonic. And uh, this is it right here. So here's the default username, IEI Emerge. Here's the, the default password. We recommend that you use these defaults. <laughs> you know? So if you've got a guy who's an implementer out there, and he's going through his little checklist, recommend, vendor recommends it. <laughs> Fingerprinting. Mac OID is registered to S2 security. Dude, so easy to find, right? You scan, you get the OID, you know, you're looking for those, those octets. I scanned this box, did a, submitted a fingerprint to Fyodor for MMAP, okay? So you do MMAP application or OS fingerprinting, it's gonna get this box. I always like to contribute back. Shodan. Who here uses Shodan? Okay. Everybody's heard of Shodan, if you haven't, that's fine. Shodan is basically a, uh, um, think of it as like rainbow tables for IPs out there on the internet. So this guy is scanning all these IPs, uh, port 80, 443, 21, and uh, uh, 23. That's what he says he's doing, but I'm sure he's doing more. <laughs> So this is, you know, going back, you know, S2 security is like, oh, well, it's behind a firewall, only accessible VPN is the only way deep right, in the corporate network. I said, you know what? These boxes are easy to find. I'm going to show you how easy. So you can do that search there. And what this is, is that's the web server, right? Fingerprint. Go ahead, webs. Log in ASP. That's unique to them. Cache, and then must revalid. <coughs> so here's the showdown results to that. Go ahead, web search. 146 systems out there, guaranteed, man. These are all emerge boxes. Um, S2 net boxes, same thing. Guaranteed? Well, I can't. Uh, <laughs> There's no guarantees. Anybody get those lawyer cards yet? I really need that. <laughs> Here's a, and I'm going to step away for a second, and I only got a couple of slides, I'm going to wrap this up. but. Here's some other EDACs out there. One of these is uh, this iGuard biometric fingerprint reader. Anybody ever hear of this? In law? University. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got one of these at University of Florida because they use it for grad students to make sure they're not cheating their, their hours. When I found it, I was like, hello. And uh, they're like, oh, it's just for grad students. Well, okay. <laughs> Can I? Have access to it for a couple days. <laughs> um, so this is, you know, this iGuard, and what this is is a biometric fingerprint reader. It gives you, you know, log in, log out, and uh, you find these all over the place. Okay, that says FT Fort something. Enough of that. I reported that to Sir. So recommendations for the vendor. I love that. You can stop this. No, these guys got to conduct security evaluations. When somebody comes to them with a security vulnerability, they got to come back, right? I mean, you blow people off, and it pisses them off, you know. And and if it were not for cert, I would have just dropped all this stuff on full disclosure and, and walked away, uh, and been done with it. But uh, you know, it's kind of fun. It's kind of interesting. It, it, it keeps me amped up a little bit, which is good. So um, they got to provide better deployment guides, and that goes along with their training. They got to tighten up that third party. So that's like the DVRs and the IP video cameras and all that. You know, they can't say that you use these default passwords. They got to really tighten that up. Their logging, their logging sucks. And in the paper that I'm writing, which will come out in about four or five weeks, uh, I'm going to really get into more details on that. But getting back to that Yale example of that young lady getting killed, nobody's going to debate that the logs aren't important on these. Especially if that system goes down, right? And um, the nodes can't communicate back to the logs, so you don't know what's going on. Better HTTP daemon. You know, if you're going to pitch this thing as you can manage it from anywhere, then that's, that's the problem. Uh, and you're really exposing yourself. FTP, you know, basic stuff, right? Nothing, nothing too sexy here. 
So these customers, you know, these are you guys, right? I mean, you gotta, you gotta demand it. You gotta know about it, which is one. You gotta know about the issues, which is one of the reasons that I'm doing this and I'm speaking up and publishing these vulnerabilities. And it's just like any other IT system. So you need to make that case to your facilities management people and your management that, you know, hey, we're putting these systems in, they're just like any other box. It's a Linux box. And we need to watch it, we need to protect it. We need to do VLANs and MAC authentication, VPN, VPNs, and restrict the IPs that can admin it. We need to do all that, that due diligence, best practices stuff. So, that's about it. Um, just uh, really want to say a special thanks to the Carolina Con organizers. I'm kind of a, you know, I've never been to this conference before. I'm really pleased with what I've seen, uh, except for a couple of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, the communications were great. You know, and I'm just, I'm real excited to, to be here. And uh, I hope that you got something out of this. Please bear in mind that this is a, a, a teaser precursor to what's coming up. You know, this paper is going to be, it's going to be good, and uh, I'm going to release it after hacking the box to buy. You know, talk about a flight. Oh my god, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but I just want to go over there, you know, I want to try to see this world when I can. Final thing I'll say is just, uh, you know, the security community, I mean, met some great people in this community. I mean, really, for all the bad shit that we allegedly do, you know, there's a lot of big hearts and a lot of care about society and about uh, ethics, Patriotism and what we want to go with this country. A lot of good stuff. A lot of bad stuff, too. That's what comes with it. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to be around. So, I mean, if you spot me, you want to get a little one on one time, uh, that's great. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>